What's good, everybody? This is Paris Bowens, and listen, right now you are watching Colors. That's right, Colors. It's my new show, vlog, tutorial, special, whatever you want to call it, based on the subject of auxiliary keyboards. That's right, auxiliary keyboards. You might, you may not know what it means to be an auxiliary keyboardist, but let me just let you know. In a band, you have multiple different parts, and let me let me just break it down to the simplest form. Um, in the band, you know about the drummer, you know about the bass player, uh, you know about the guitar player, and you even know about the keyboard player. Usually what that keyboard player is known as is the main keyboard player. But in the case where you have multiple keyboard players, you have your main keyboard player and then you have your secondary keyboard player, which would be in most cases considered the auxiliary keyboard player. Well, what is the auxiliary keyboard player? The auxiliary keyboard player is literally the colors guy, hence the title of this show, um, Colors. It's your guy who does specials, it's your guy who does sounds, it's your guy who does all of the colors of the music. So for instance, if I'm, going, if I'm recording something and I'll play a song, here's an example right here. So in that example, right, you have strictly drums, bass, piano, maybe a guitar. Those are your, your basic instruments, right? That's gonna help build the song out. Well, an auxiliary player will do this. So your auxiliary guy is, is not just playing one instrument. Even though he may just be using the instrument of keyboards, your auxiliary player is not the guy who's just playing one instrument. Your auxiliary guy is the guy who's filling in the gaps, who's either accenting the music, making it bigger, um, accenting, highlighting, highlighting specific parts, complementing different things that the vocalist may be doing, something that somebody may be doing on the cymbals, or you know, if the piano player is playing something and then he's playing specific lines and motifs, that auxiliary player may accentuate those lines. He may actually highlight those different lines. Um, and sometimes your auxiliary player is, is literally sitting out of the music um, when he is not necessarily needed. People, people think always playing something is, is always a part of the music. Silence is also a part of the music. And so a good auxiliary player knows uh, when to play, what to play, what not to play, when not to play. That's just as important as actually playing. So what I'm going to be doing is going to be giving you an example of a song um, from a recording perspective. Um, now I've now I've had the experience of actually touring. Um, it, uh, I've toured. I've recorded. I've done studio recordings, live recordings. I've toured. I've arranged, programmed, um, designed sounds um, for church. All of it, right? Um, most people when they when they buy a keyboard, especially specifically us who tickle the ivories. Um, but when you tend to buy a keyboard, keyboards are very expensive. Um, most people don't play more than a few sounds um, out of that keyboard. Um, most people would gravitate towards the pianos, the roads, um, the EP, the electric pianos, um, things of that nature. Sometimes your strings, sometimes your horn patches. Um, if you're playing key bass, your synth key bass patches, and then sometimes synth lead patches. These days you're starting to hear more people open up a little bit more because a lot of the music that's being produced these days require a little bit more than your basic foundational sound. Um, songwriters, you know, from you know, if I'm writing a song, um, I'm gonna usually gravitate towards my piano first or my Fender Rouge or something like that. Those things help to inspire me from writing lyrics and trying to figure out a way to tell a story format and things like that. Um, but you can be inspired by so many different things these days. Um, usually, when I get on a keyboard, I'll surf through the board to find sound. And a sound may trigger an idea from a production standpoint. Um, but there are many different facets to the aux auxiliary player. And you can literally approach it um, so many different ways now. For, for instance, if I'm in the studio as an auxiliary player, I approach how I do my sounds a little different than when I am playing live. If I'm in, coming into a rehearsal and I'm taking somebody's music off of a record that I, I, I got to learn... I'm playing for a specific artist and I have to learn their record. If I'm the auxiliary guy, 
I'm listening to everything that's going on in the record, but I'm trying to find those specific sounds that are not always that I've that easy to find. And being a good aux player is learning to find the sounds because you gotta think when you listen to a record, you listen to an album, the sounds that you're listening for to play auxiliary. You gotta think a mix engineer is, is panning something left, he's compressing, he's tucking certain sounds in the back so you can feel them more than you can hear them. Um, and so they're not always gonna be obvious. Your notes are not always gonna be obvious. You will have your more obvious sounds that will stand out. But when you're doing shows and tours and things of that nature, um, not only are you trying to build the song that you heard, you're also trying to make the show a little bit more exciting. And a lot of times your artists, your music directors, if you're not the music director, um, producers and things like that are going to reach out to you to be the person to open that whole thing up. Like, I've been on gigs and shows and tours and services and church and concerts and where I've been responsible for, all right, we need to make this bigger. Paris, open it up. And I'm like, you know, when, I, when that first thought it happened to me, I did not know what that meant. I was, in fact, one of the first artists um, that I that I got a chance to work with um, for for about ten years. Um, Ty Tribbett and GA. Well, we had if you don't know anything about Ty Tribbett and GA, his band's name was Soundcheck. And um, it's funny because I was the main I was the main keyboard player, yet I had the responsibility of an auxiliary player being the main player. So it, it definitely gave me a different um, approach, and it it taught me uh, pretty much how to stretch myself because. I kind of came to the band with the mindset of being a piano player, study people like John Peters and Art Tatum and Chikoria, and I'm studying to be that guy. And when I came to the band, I'm coming to the, to the table specifically with that in mind. And in this band, you had myself, you had Dana Saray, who was organs. Now, Dana was organ second keys. Um, I was kind of, I kind of came in as mains. We had another guy at the time named Mike Williams. He was strictly aux, so I was like your piano mains. Yeah, Mike Williams was strictly sounds. And then Mike left not too long after I came, so I ended up having to take on both his role and my role. And then there were many times where Dana didn't come out. So I had to fill the gap of what, what somebody would be playing organ over here and second keys, along with me playing my main instrument, which whether it was Rhodes or piano or something, um, I had to learn how to cover those parts. And we also had a horn section. Um, if you, we had a five piece horn section. We had uh, two saxes, trumpet, trombone, and a flute player. Um, we had at times two different guitar players. There would be times we would go out to shows and the guitar players wouldn't come or we didn't have all our horns, um, didn't have the second keys. So then there would be those times where Ty would come over to me and be like, Paris. We don't got another keyboard player today. We don't got a guitar player today. You got to fill it up. And it was in those moments and those opportunities and times where I learned the art of being an auxiliary player. And when I say that was when I first started pulling, I got my two keyboards here, then there will be an organ and a keyboard on top of the organ and then another set of keyboards. And at that time, my perf the boards that I was using, I was playing the Motif. Back then, That was it was before the ES. I was using the regular Motif 8. Then I had a Triton on top. Then on Dana, Dana had an organ. And back then he used to play the chord Karma. I don't know if y'all remember that keyboard. He had the Karma. And then on this side I would have a, another motif. Uh, and what would he have? And then I think Dana had a Phantom. Early, early edition Phantom, the, the Rolling Phantoms. And um, so I had to learn, okay. At that time I didn't know what fill it up meant. Um, I just had to figure it out until Ty was satisfied, until he felt like the music was there. And of course, at that time, I didn't know nothing about MIDI, and, but I do know that I'm gonna dig in a little bit more and give you guys more examples of, of different approaches to playing auxiliary, whether it is being in a studio session, whether it is being on a live tour. There are some artists who don't require as much. There are gigs where I've done auxiliary where I've only used a double tier. I will have my two main you know, I can tell you what those, what that is, and then what is it to use four keyboards, then what is it used to use six keyboards, and add an organ to your, you know what I mean? So, for for church, there's a setup for pop gigs, for R&B gigs, for soul gigs, for jazz gigs, for hip-hop gigs, there's different setups. Um, but we'll get into that some more. But keep following me right here on Colors. I'm Paris Bowens. Peace.